Hello, dear listeners, and welcome to Movie Review number 10. Today, I want to talk about the 2016 science fiction movie Arrival, directed by Denis Villeneuve, which was based on a short story called Story of Your Life by Ted Chiang. I personally loved this movie, even if some elements of it uh, were a little scientifically dubious. Although, I don't want to overstate my criticisms going into this. Arrival is a great movie, and none of my criticisms are anything more than kind of pedantic and trivial nitpicking. Except maybe one criticism that has to do with the overarching narrative that the entire film relies on, but I'll get to that in the end, and you can be the judge of how valid or how important that criticism is. I think there's ample room for people on either side of that particular issue, but without foreshadowing it or explaining it too much, let me dive right into the review. Arrival has a neat little storytelling structure that's a little less formulaic than your average movie, and Arrival pulled it off in a really original way. The plot applies a controversial linguistic theory to a first contact event, and it explores the ramifications and consequences of the presence of the aliens and what they're trying to give us. A lot of the conflict in the story is based on misinterpreting language, on misunderstanding the meaning of words and symbols, and the danger and destruction that can potentially happen because of that misunderstanding. As far as alien movies go, the plot is really original and non-traditional. I mean, you can probably think of a dozen alien invasion movies, or movies with alien monster antagonists, but you probably won't be able to think of another movie like this. The only movie I've seen with a realistic portrayal of benevolent aliens was in the movie Contact, but that came out over two decades ago. So the movie begins with a few scenes of the protagonist and her daughter, who is an infant, and then a child, and then a teenager, who then becomes ill as a young adult and dies. After this stream of scenes is over, the present story begins. The protagonist is Luis Banks, played by Amy Adams, who we find out is a linguistic professor at a university. And she's going to teach her class, but when she gets there, there's hardly any students, only like five or six even bothered to show up. She tries to get started, but they soon get news alerts and they check the TV to see reports of massive alien objects landing in a dozen different places all over the planet. It's kind of unsettling. She dismisses her class, everyone leaves, she goes home, she's passing people in the parking lot who are kind of desperate, they're scared, they're driving impatiently, and they're yelling at each other. Later, she watches protests on the news, and she listens to the radio about borders being closed. Government lockdowns and emergency controls are damaging the economy, and they're terrifying the populace. Things are really getting out of control. A military officer involved in the official investigations meets her at her office. He gives her a tape of human researchers trying to talk to the alien occupants of the object, and he asks her for her professional input. He gives her the opportunity to join the research team. They're taken to the site of an alien ship that exists over North America, specifically over Montana, where she's expected to attempt to communicate with the aliens. She first sees the alien ships while flying in. They look like massive blood cells, but black instead of red. It's emitting no radiation, no light besides what's reflected off of it. It's emitting no waste or gases or signals of any kind, as far as the humans can tell. It's just ominously hanging there in the sky, oriented vertically with its lower limb about 50 feet off the ground. There's no propulsion mechanism that's immediately apparent on the ship. It's just silently floating. But in later scenes, when, when, it, uh, when it rises a little bit off the ground, or they send down a little pod for Luis, you hear uh, that it does make noises as it kind of somehow moves the air. But in this scene, in this opening scene where the ship is introduced, it's really creepy and surreal with eerie music. I loved this part. I thought it was really cool. I always love that scene where it first opens up on the alien and the characters first see it and it's like, da, 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 and they're all shocked and terrified. And if the movie can pull it off right, it's usually for the viewer really unsettling and creepy. And I, I love it. I think that's a great part of alien films. Anyway, the protagonist meets a character named Ian Donnelly, who's played by Jeremy Renner. 
Ian Donnelly is a theoretical physicist. Uh, where Louise thinks the world and society and civilization is all built on language, Ian Donnelly tends to think that it's all built on science. It's their two little worldviews kind of bumping heads a little bit. Uh, it's cute, um, and it's kind of touched on a little bit as the movie goes on, but it's not, a, it's not a big, weighty part of the plot. Working together in the here and now, their mission is to communicate with the aliens and learn why they're here and what they want. They take some antibiotics, and they suit up, and they get taken to the ship, which has a very small opening that runs vertically into the bottom of the craft. This takes them to a little room with a big glass window where they can speak to the aliens, who themselves dwell deeper within the confines of the ship. As far as they can tell from the window, the inside of the ship is just a giant cavity filled with mist, housing two of the alien occupants. The first glimpse of the aliens is really exciting. It's just like the first glimpse of their ship. It's exciting and primal. After ample setup, the aliens emerge from the mist in front of the window, and they make strange clicking, growling, and booing noises, like whale song. The visible portion of their bodies looks like a squid with leathery blue-black skin and seven long jointed tentacles. The seven tentacles earn them the name heptopods. They have five forward-pointing tentacles, like your four fingers, and they have two tentacles in the back, one on each side, kind of like thumbs. These tentacles move and flex, bending at knobbly joints, displaying a clear alien physiology. In a second session with the aliens, they find that the tentacles have something like hands. At the tip, they split cleanly into seven smaller tentacles, which can fold together to make a seamless tip for the whole tentacle arm. An organ that exists in the palm of this small little hand allows them to release an inky, gas-like substance, which can be manipulated to form a symbol. These symbols are the alien language, and they're a crucial aspect of the plot. They're like the key to the story. As Luis continues to study these alien symbols, uh, the alien language, the Americans are communicating as part of a global effort with all of the other countries who also have alien craft in their territory. Unlocking the language is a challenging task, and all the people around the world working on it are really kind of struggling to crack it. As Luis learns the language from first-hand experience with the heptopods, she begins to have visions of her daughter, similar to what was shown in the first few scenes of the film, except they begin to show more and more moments and details of her daughter's life. About 62 minutes into the film, Ian Donnelly mentions a linguistic theory about rewiring your brain by immersing yourself in a new language. Luis confirms it, saying that it's the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which argues for a sense of linguistic relativity. The language you speak influences your worldview, or as the protagonists say, quote, how you think, how you see everything. Ian asks her if she dreams in the heptopod language, and her kind of defensive response implies waking hallucinations of the aliens. Dreaming about the aliens, having waking hallucinations of them because of the overwork and the stress, that seems like a pretty realistic psychological response to being put into such an extreme, intense, stressful scenario with literal aliens. I mean, seriously, the amount of cognitive and emotional, perhaps even spiritual stress that that puts on somebody has to be tremendous. Anyway, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis wasn't really ever formally defined and multiple versions of it are worded slightly differently and make slightly different claims. But the general idea, as it's currently understood, is that the structure and the nature of your language can and does have a non-trivial influence on certain parts of your thinking, certain parts of your perception and your worldly beliefs. This is as opposed to strong claims of control that typically over-exaggerate the magnitude of the effect. The plot of Arrival is built on this theory, as it enables the protagonist to literally perceive time differently. When they get to a point in their research where they can ask why the aliens have come to Earth, Luis translates their response to mean, offer weapon. The researchers in China, who were using a game-based method of communication based off of the Chinese game Mahjong, 
It has a linguistic architecture that would have an inherent victor and a loser. And so the researchers interpret their response from the aliens to mean, use weapon. This causes a total shitstorm, as the world now thinks the aliens are here to divide us and make us war against each other until we're weakened and we can be easily conquered by the aliens themselves. The Chinese military is being led by a General Shang, who is the first to lose trust in the aliens and prepare for military retaliation. It's pretty much the worst case scenario, and the communicating countries begin to get scared, and they drop off the grid and everyone gets blacked out. The entire world seems to be splintering apart. The whole time the protagonists are having their sessions with, uh, with the heptopods, there are soldiers who have been guarding them and carrying equipment for them and operating the video cameras and stuff all during these sessions. And when there's no sessions going on, uh, when the scientists are just doing their research and they're not you know, in the ship talking to the aliens, those soldiers are just kind of hanging out in their barracks. They're just killing time waiting for their next orders. While they're doing this, they're listening to uh, your generic right-wing podcaster-type character. They show that the soldiers kind of get radicalized by a combination of uh, their wives calling in and being very scared because no one knows what's going on. They all think they're going to die. Uh, they think it's the end of the world. So these guys have this emotional pressure on that side. And then they're also being radicalized by their own entertainment, you know, by these generic right-wing Limbaugh-esque radio personalities that are, they're, it's, it's goading them into committing violence against the aliens. The, the radio personality guy, the, the podcaster that they're listening to, says that they need to start firing back and make a shot across the bow as like a warning to the aliens. These rogue soldiers end up planting a bomb, which goes off during an impromptu session with Luis, Ian, and the heptopods. During that impromptu session where the soldiers are kind of awkwardly hanging out on the ground outside the ship, the heptopods give them a huge amount of data, all of the data, and then they force them out of the ship before the explosion, saving their lives. Later on in the, uh, in the camp, talking to the intelligence officers and the military officers and stuff, Luis argues against panic and retaliation, saying that the weapon is probably a mistranslation or a misunderstanding, either by them or by the heptopods, where uh, the, the intended meaning was tool or information. Ian later finds out that the heptopods gave them a three-dimensional image, packed with data, with a heavy emphasis on time. Their little heptopod symbol for time is scattered all throughout this, this whole giant data package that, that they were given. Ian finds out that the data takes up one-twelfth of the volume of the space that it was projected across, giving them a clue as to its purpose. They figure out that each ship gave out one-twelfth of the total data they came to Earth to deliver. By splitting the data up 12 ways across the surface of the Earth, this forces humans to cooperate instead of fight with each other. The conflict of the movie comes to a head as Luis tries to convince a divided and a terrified world that the heptopods have come to deliver a tool, not to use a weapon. Right before they evacuate, she goes to the alien ship and is carried into it, where she stands in the open, mist-filled cavity deep in the alien spacecraft. She comes face to face with a heptopod and sees that their bodies are actually massive, extending upwards into a huge, extended, club-like form with a narrowed tip at the very top. The heptopod explains to her that the weapon is a tool, and that tool is their language. As the alien says, it opens time. By allowing those who understand the language to perceive time non-linearly, they can perceive the future. This reveals that Louise's visions of her daughter are actually premonitions of her in the future, from a childhood that hasn't happened yet. The heptopod explains that 3,000 years into the future, the heptopods will need humanity's help, so they're here, giving them the language now, so that the future may unfold as they've perceived it. I won't explain the climax, because it's pretty cool, but Luis is able to get General Shang to back down, and eventually release China's one-twelfth of the data. And she also gets Russia and Sudan to, to do it as well. Uh, they were cooperating with China during all of the chaos. This eventually leads to a de-escalation. The world powers begin to work together, and the aliens leave. 
The exposed heptapod's body is huge, easily six times the height of an adult person. The seven tentacles are actually relatively thin appendages on the very bottom of their bodies. The upper portion of their bodies expands into a large, somewhat flattened mass, kind of like a gas bladder. They seem to live in an extremely thick, almost fluid, gaseous mixture, which is the mist in their chamber, and it's what Luis was exposed to without any apparent health repercussions. Perhaps these aliens breathe oxygen, or maybe they breathe nitrogen, and they just have a biocompatible atmosphere with humans. You know, maybe it has like 20% oxygen in it, or whatever. That would be pretty cool, and it would explain how Luis and the heptapod were able to talk at the very end. However, it's just it's statistically unlikely for the heptapods with their crazy body form to have evolved in an atmosphere that was somehow biocompatible with Earth. I mean, I suppose it could happen, but to me it just seems um, very improbable. And for that matter, what about germs? They don't really address this, it's, it's not really anything that's mentioned. All the people going into the ship through the small little opening were wearing like hazmat suits and they were taking like extensive biological preparations and everyone made a big fuss about it when Louise first took her suit off inside of that little chamber room in front of the heptapods. But now she's apparently able to be within the ship in the same space as the heptapods, there's no divider window or anything between them, and any germs that are present are just not really acknowledged. It doesn't seem to affect her when she goes back outside to Earth. She's not, like, decontaminated, uh, even though that was, like, straight-up direct contact with an alien organism. It just seems like the movie's uh, kind of uh, realistic portrayal of germs throughout most of it just kind of breaks down here at the end. They just kind of forget about it for the sake of that one scene. Anyway, uh, more generally, the heptapods swim, or they float around in this dense, gaseous mixture, and this sheds some light on the conditions on their home planet, or their, their evolutionary conditions. They appear to be some kind of floating organism that utilizes a massive gas bladder, or some kind of buoyant tissue, so as to float in their thick atmosphere. It could be that their tentacle limbs reach down to the ground, just hanging off of this buoyant platform, and they're used to gather food. Besides this, they don't have any apparent eyes, or ears, or mouths for that matter. Although, I kind of think that their mouth might exist in, uh, in the palm, or in the bottom of the central structure where all of the seven limbs are protruding from. As far as I can tell, this morphological structure is feasible although I don't think it exists on any life form on Earth. I mean, if you think of the ocean floor as an analogous habitat, with a dense, fluid-like matrix surrounding them, we don't really have any organisms here on Earth that float with a gas bladder that, has a, uh, that supports a lower body structure that dangles down off of this gas bladder and collects food off of the bottom of the ocean. The closest thing that I can think of to this is a jellyfish, but they don't have brains, and their body structure is much less complicated than the heptapods. Octopus and squid are also, you know, really close examples, but they just don't have the same hanging from a gas bladder kind of metamorphological structure. Now, I don't think the heptapods are impossible organisms, necessarily, but I'm kind of skeptical of their plausibility. I mean, how dense are they? How heavy are they? How thick is their atmosphere? Judging by their size and by the environment inside of their ship, it seems like their atmosphere, uh, relative to Earth atmosphere, might be kind of extreme. There's also a romantic angle to the story, uh, between Luis and Ian which officially results in a relationship that starts at the end of the movie, after the heptapod issue has been concluded. Through Luis's premonitions, it's explained that she knew she would marry Ian, and she knew that they would have a daughter, and she knew the daughter would develop a terminal disease and die. When the daughter was around 10 years old, Luis told Ian of her premonitions, of her foreknowledge, and because of this, he left them. The ten-year-old daughter said that her dad doesn't look at her the same way, and Louise has to explain to her daughter that it's her fault because of what she knew. The daughter then grows up and dies, just as Louise always knew she would. Ian left them because he was unable to cope with knowing that Louise could do that, that she did that. He says that she made the wrong choice. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty emotionally and ethically heavy ending to the movie. If you think about it, being able to foresee the future would be, in many ways, 
terrible. You would know the outcomes of your decisions. You would know the outcome of your life. This would take a lot of surprise and spontaneity out of it, don't you think? If you knew the outcomes of your decisions, you might try to change them to change the outcome. And perhaps you would find out in a gruesome, Greek tragedy kind of way that you can't escape your fate. Or you might just submit to the dominating whims of fate, where you'd have to helplessly experience all of the consequences of the bad choices that you've made, even though you were able to recognize that choice as a bad choice, and you've regretted it far before you ever actually made that bad choice. I mean, that's like seeing all the mistakes you're going to make, knowing they're going to happen, and yet being unable to stop them, and knowing that you're going to have to deal with the fallout, with the consequences. That sounds like a hellish condition to be in, to live in. So, while Luis is given this amazing kind of perception of time because of her fluency in the heptapod language, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's all sunshine and rainbows. It seems like there's some legitimately bad sides to this. Overall, I give Arrival a very strong score. 9.5 out of 10 for its plot, and 9 out of 10 for its depiction of alien biology. The plot, in my opinion, was unique and well done, and it was all entirely feasible and within reason, perhaps with the slight exaggeration of the effect of the Sapir Whorf phenomenon. But that exaggerated portrayal was necessary for the plot to advance and for the plot to conclude. The aliens themselves were potentially realistic, you know, I didn't see anything that just screamed stupid or impossible, but there was quite a bit of uh, imaginative license on top of the basic scientific principles. Altogether, uh, my criticisms hardly take away from the movie, which is excellent and thought-provoking entertainment. 